Fabrica! Welcome to this special Taino culture episode. I'm Priscilla Colon, co founder and creative here at Casa Reito, where our mission is to promote the Taino language and culture. So today we're continuing with Taino female chiefs. If you didn't get a chance to see part one last week, I've left the link below for you. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Taino female chiefs of Haiti, Quisqueya. And of course, we're going to talk about one of the most famous ones, Ana Kaona. As I mentioned last week, some of the topics that we're going to be covering are not suitable for young children. So, if you have young children who usually watch these videos, please pre screen this episode, watch it beforehand, before you show it to your young children. We're going to talk about some terrible events that occurred in history, and I will try to give you a trigger warning right before we talk about it, in case you have young children with you. Now, let's start with our episode. I'm super excited for this one. So let's begin by talking about the chiefdoms of Haiti Quisqueya. When the Spaniards came, the island that we may know today as Hispaniola was actually named Haiti. In some cases, it may have even been called Quisqueya. Today, I'm just using the name Haiti Quisqueya to refer to one island, not separate countries. This island was divided into five chiefdoms, Magua, Igüe, Maguana, Marien, and Caragua. And it's important to note that this wasn't always the case. For example, we know that the chiefdom of Jaragua was actually formed when two other chiefdoms united. Now, let's read some of the chronicles to find out when female chiefs are mentioned. Now, I have to give you the first trigger warning. There is something mentioned in the following quote that may not be suitable for young children. This comes from Bartolomé de las Casas in his Historia de las Indias, that is, a history of the Indies. He writes, The fifth kingdom was called Igüe, which was ruled by an old queen named Iguanama. She was hanged. Now, let's take a look at another female chief that isn't really talked about. This comes from the chronicle written by Gonzalo Fernández de Oviedo around 1495. And he says, Fleeing from La Isabela, they went up the coast until they arrived where the city of Santo Domingo is currently situated. And they stopped in the settlement because they found an Indian village. Miguel Diaz became friends with the chief who was later renamed Catalina. And in time, they had two children. So who is Oviedo describing here? He's describing Cacique Osema, who was later named Catalina. So here's what happened. There was a Spaniard named Miguel Diaz who had actually gotten into a fight with another Spaniard, injuring him, and he eventually died. So Miguel Diaz had to flee because the other Spaniards were going to kill him. As he was running away, he stumbled upon this Taino village, and the cacique just happened to be a female, and her name was Osema. Now, as you can tell from the description, she not only took him in, rescued him, she also befriended him, and they had children together. One note, during today's episode, we're going to be talking about some of the relationships that these female chiefs had with men. Sometimes these relationships are called marriage. Sometimes they're called friendship. When we talk about marriage or friendship, we don't really know what it meant to Tainos. We know what marriage means today or what a friendship means today, what a boyfriend or girlfriend is. But in some cases, we can deduce that some of these marriages or friendships were the result of alliances. They wanted to make sure that two different chiefdoms would become allies, more like family. Obviously, if somebody got together and had children, they probably were in it for the long haul. But we can't always assume that they had the same types of relationships that we have nowadays. Now let's talk about a very important Taino female cacique, Ana Kaona. Cacique Ana Caona was born around 1474 in Yaguana, the capital of the chiefdom of Jaragua. This is where present-day Leogon, Haiti is. Ana Caona came from a matrilineal chief's line. 
and she married Kaonabo, a Lucayan Taino who was the chief of Maguana. Kaonabo was Lucayo. That is a Taino from the Bahamas, but he was also the chief of Maguana. That is the chiefdom right next to Jaragua. Before colonization, the head chief of Jaragua was Boechio. That is Anacaona's brother. And you know that the next person in line is Anacaona because they're from a matrilineal line. This is important to know because when you see that Anacaona, the next chief in line, marries Kaonabo, the chief of Maguana, you realize that they're establishing an alliance between these two chiefdoms. However, we don't know Anacaona and Kaonabo's other intentions. We do know that they had one daughter, Iguemota. Now, Kaonabo was arrested in 1494 and died in 1496. Now, the backstory here is really important. Kaonabo had made enemies of the Spaniards. After Columbus and his men crash landed on Haiti Quisqueya, Columbus was forced to leave a small group of men behind while he went back to Spain. Here comes another trigger warning. According to Tainos, the men who were left behind began stealing, killing, and raping women. And so Kaonabo and a bunch of fighters went over and slaughtered them. When Columbus came back, all of the men he'd left were gone. So as you can imagine, Kaonabo became enemy number one. That's why eventually he was captured and killed. Now, when Kaonabo died, Ana Kaona went back to her chiefdom of Jaragua to be her brother's advisor. Remember, she would not have been chief of Maguana because that job belongs to somebody on Kaonabo's matrilineal line. She went back to her matrilineal line in Jaragua. Ana Kaona's brother Boechio died in 1500, which means that she became the chief of Jaragua. And as a very influential chief, she was also known as a poet and a diplomat, and as the chief of the largest region, she became the principal chief of the entire island of Haiti Quisqueya. Now, what happened to Ana Kaona? Let's talk about that next. But before we do, I have to give you a trigger warning. This is one of the most horrific events chronicled in Taino history. So if you have young children, make sure that you are pre-screening this before they watch this, or you may not want them to watch this part of the video at all. This comes from Diego Mendez. I took the road through the land of Jaragua, where I found the governor who had me there for seven months, until he had 84 chiefs, lords and vassals, burned and hanged, and with them the principal lady of the island. Bartolomé de las Casas, the friar who was known as the defender of the Indians, gives us a little bit more detail, so let's read what he says. The governor arrived one day with 60 men on horseback and more than 300 infantrymen, and through treachery he convinced more than 300 lords to enter a large house made of straw. Once inside, he ordered the place set on fire, and they were burned alive. All the others, as well as an infinite number of people, were run through with swords, and as an honor, the great lady, Ana Kaona, was hanged. What you just heard occurred in 1503, and it was a huge massacre. As the principal chief of the island, Ana Kaona was asked to bring all of the other chiefs and people of high rank for peace talks with the Spaniards. When they got there, Nicolás de Ovando, pretending that he was going to hold a Catholic mass in honor of all the chiefs, had them all go into a cane, that is a straw home specifically for chiefs. But when they were in there, he had the doors locked and the building was set on fire. So he had them burned alive. And then they turned around and slaughtered the rest of the people in attendance, including babies. Please note, some of the images that you will see on the screen are not suitable for young children, but I've included them because they are actual illustrations found in the Chronicles to show the horrific atrocities that were inflicted on our people. So, as you can see, we've talked about female chiefs from Aitikisqueya who are obviously chiefs before colonization. 
So why does this myth persist that the Spanish were making females into chiefs to control them? Well, it comes from the fact that some Spanish commoners began marrying female chiefs. These commoners effectively raised their status among other Spaniards. As you may recall from previous videos, the Spanish society was very much structured in hierarchy. The king was at the top, the noblemen came next, and then the commoners. So if a commoner married a female chief, he practically became a king. So it wasn't that Spaniards were raising the status of Taino women. It's that they were raising their own status by marrying chiefs. How did the Spanish crown react to this? Bartolomé de las Casas writes, As soon as they were married, their Indians would be taken away and given as slaves to another Spaniard. So the men wouldn't be so presumptuous as to think of themselves as lords, depriving the ladies of their status and vassals, what was rightfully theirs by nature, by the will of the people, and even by divine order, via succession. So what is Bartolomé describing here? He's describing the horrific practice of the encomienda system. In this encomienda system, the land was divided among Spaniards. And then the Tainos were distributed as slave labor among the new landowners. The chiefs were forced into slavery, arrested, sent away, or killed to stop insurrection. This was a practice that they started as they began colonization. But if a male commoner, a Spaniard, married a female chief, they came down even harder. One of the things you need to understand about this encomienda system is how horrific it was. Now, these quote-unquote Indians, these Tainos, didn't belong to the chief. They were her family. Remember, we learned that clans are made up of related families. So she was the head of all of her family. So when they were dividing these people up and making them slaves, they were literally ripping apart her family. In the 1514 distribution of Santo Domingo, that is a list that was created to split up all of the chiefs and their Tainos and assign them to different plantations and mines, we find a list of female chiefs and the quote-unquote Indians that belong to them some of them are in charge of large numbers of people. And in this list, there are 36 female chiefs named. Of a total of 409 chiefs, that would mean that about 8% are female chiefs. Although some estimates show that it may have been 15% female chiefs based on the total number of chiefs at that time. So the total number of chiefs on the island, whether at that time or before, could have been way higher, which means that the number of female chiefs could have been way more as well. I would love to take a moment to just read the names of the female chiefs that we have. I know in many cases these are their quote-unquote Christian names that we don't know their original names. And we may not know all of the other chiefs names that existed, but I feel like in this moment let's take the opportunity to acknowledge them because they are the reason that we're here today. Barahona, Isabel, Luisa, Maria Yamanex, Airabón, Catalina de Mayama, Inés de Ibitracoa, Catalina de Curiama, Casica de Catabano de Igüe, María Magarán, Isabel de Ama, Leonor de Aramana, Francisca de Aramana, Catalina de Ayaybex, Isabel de Iguanama, María de Igüey, Carolina de Agara, Catalina de Abacoa, María Alonso, Inés, Foronda del Macabonao, Isabel del Macabonao, Loisa, Luisa, Isabel Rodríguez, Mayaguamaca, Beatriz, Luisa, Mendoza, Beatriz, Mari Sánchez, Lucía, 
María de Luna, Elvira, Gracia, Elvira. It's important that we say these names that have remained unspoken for more than 500 years. In that way, I hope that I can honor these ancestors. To be perfectly honest, this series has been a little hard to do. It brings me to tears every time I think of what our ancestors had to go through. But I think it's very important that we remember these stories. So next time, we're going to continue with the female chiefs of Boriken. I'm sure a lot of you Boricua out there have been waiting anxiously for this one. In the meantime, tai karaya, guaitiao nago.